house of the Lord. Brother Eli, if you don't mind collecting the Sunday school offering, please. Of course, the notes are back on the communion table as usual for today. <coughs> now, we've been doing our study on the book of Psalms. So we've been doing our study on the book of Psalms. And one thing we learned about the book of Psalms is it's not like any other book of the Bible. When we read every other book of the Bible, we find that they're God's words to us. But rather, when we look at the book of Psalms, they're man's words to God. Why do people go to the book of Psalms when, it feels, uh, when they feel down or they need encouragement or something like that? Because the book of Psalms portrays our hearts. You can find a psalm in there that conveys a feeling or expression or maybe something that we cannot put into words to really, not that God doesn't know how we're feeling or what we're feeling, but if you really want to try to convey it to him, this is the one thing that we go to try to convey our emotions to God sometimes. And it uplifts us and it encourages us. Why is that? Because when we look at the book of Psalms, it is a songbook. How many people, when they're feeling down an hour, or they've been kicked down and dragged through the mud, they go to a song to, for encouragement or to uplift them, uh, the soothing tone? The book of Psalms is exactly that. It is a song, a book of songs. It is the Jewish songbook. And does anybody know who wrote the book of Psalms? Exactly! A whole bunch of people. That is exactly right. And we do not know their name. But we do know that how many contributors, how many editors were there to the book of Psalms? Three. Three. And how many of those do we know their name? One. One. And that name is? It's <laughs> eighteen. I might have walked out the door. All these months of teaching just went out the drain. No, it was David. And that's why when most people talk about David wrote the book of Psalms, or um, even if you read commentaries, they might say that David wrote the book of Psalms. They're really attributing to the fact that he's the only known editor to the book of Psalms, so that's the only place, the only name we can really attach to it. And we know that because I think it's Psalm chapter 72 states that the songs of David have ended. Can anyone tell me why the book of Psalms was compiled in the first place? It's a, it's a collection of poems, but if we get back to it, what's the one thing that David had when it's hard to do? He had within his heart he wanted to build the, ta the temple of God. He wanted a permanent place or a permanent play house for the house of, for our God to dwell in. And when I didn't even hear what he was saying since the stretch, so I'm just keep going. I won't lie. But no, David wanted a permanent house for God to dwell in. And while David was alive, was he allowed to build that house? No, he had too much bloodshed on his hands. But while he was there, he still wanted to give glory to God the best of his ability. So he set up his tent. He made a place for the Ark of the Covenant to dwell in for the time being, which was the symbol of God's throne on earth. And he placed musicians and singers around him 24-7. And you don't want to come to church and sing the same song over and over and over. And I highly doubt it. Because there's so much more to convey what's in our heart and our feelings and our emotions than just the same song over and over. Not that God can't move with songs like Amen, but ain't sing over and over. But you want a variety because you want to express to God how you're feeling. You know, when we sing about heaven, we get excited how we are joyful that we want to be there one day. And one day our feet are going to strike heaven. Sometimes we just have a pride in our heart that 
oh, I want to see him, I look upon his face, you know, it's just something about it. The book of Psalms was written or compiled for that exact purpose. It was for the singers and the musicians to have different songs to give God praise and glory as they sang and played around the Ark of the Covenant 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 52 days, 52 weeks a year in our calendar. Not the Jewish calendar, but in our calendar. But then we go went into Hebrew style poetry. So we're going to move on to there. And when we look at the book of Psalms and we look at some of these big words, what does Proverbs chapter, I think it's 24, verse 2 say? Let me find it and make sure. Before I have anybody go there. Proverbs 25 and verse 2. So when we look at that word mictum, 
it leans towards the fact that it was a permanent call. It was a golden song. It was something to be cherished and taken um, personally and taken care for, carefully. Sometimes if we have those things in our life that we keep them sacred, we keep a hedge of protection about them, we protect them because they're important to us. So this was a golden song or an important song of David. Now, if we start looking at our notes for today, we're going to be looking in Psalm chapter 2. Psalm chapter 2. And I'll go ahead and read that. We're looking at 12 verses of what this psalm contains. And it states, Why do the heathen rage, and the people imagine a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves, and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed. Let us break their bands asunder and cast away their cords from us. He that sitteth in the heaven shall laugh. The Lord shall have them in derision. Then shall he speak unto them in his wrath and vex them in his sore displeasure. Yet have I set my, kings, my king upon my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree the Lord has said unto me. Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. Ask of me, and I shall give of thee the heathen for thy inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thy possession. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron. Thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Be wise thou therefore, O ye kings. Be instructed, ye judges of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear, and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the sons, lest he be angry, and ye perish from the way. When his wrath is kindled but a little, blessed are they that put their trust in him. When we look at Psalm chapter 2, it goes hand in hand with Psalm 1. What do I mean by that? Because Psalm chapter 1 and Psalm chapter 2 are the introductory psalms or the introduction to the entire psalm book that we know as the book of Psalms. There are actually some um, Jewish rabbis, some commentators that will actually argue that Psalm 1 and Psalm 2 go hand in hand are to, and are to be jointly and are to be joined together. There are those that claim that when David was planning his Jewish songbook, that this is exactly the introduction he wanted because it deals in Psalm 1 with. Do you remember what groups of people are dealt with in Psalm 1? There are two groups. The godly and the ungodly. So in Psalm 1, David is dealing with the godly and the ungodly and talking about them. And in Psalm 2, we're talking about the Messiah and his judgment upon the ungodly. So those two go hand in hand. And when we look at that, that is the entire Bible in the nutshell. It deals with the godly, it deals with the ungodly, and it deals with the consequences that must be paid uh, with the wicked that are uh, where the punishment is poured out by the Messiah because he came to seek and save them which are lost. So if we were to look at Psalm 2, we already know how many verses it has. It contains 12 verses. If we were trying to guess some of the key words, what do you think are some of the key words, the main words, in Psalm chapter 2? And if you don't have it open, you might as well turn there because we're going to be there for quite a while. But what are some of the key words of Psalm chapter 2? Because if we look at the um, hill of Zion, it's 
there's a spiritual Mount Zion as well. So it's not just the physical Mount Zion where Jerusalem is and the temple is, or was at this point, or a portion of it remains, however you want to put it. But we have the earthly Mount Zion, but we also have the spiritual Mount Zion where the 144,000 in the book of Revelation are seen, where God's holy hill is, where his throne sits. Anything else? Heathen, because we're dealing with the heathen, the lost, those that don't know any better. What else is a, or some key words, something that kind of was discussed a bit in the song chapter 2? Oh, So we're dealing with the Messiah, the Son of God as well. Anybody else want to add anything else before we can, as, before we continue on? When it comes to key words, there are no wrong answers, really. Well, we're looking at key words, we're looking at what are the words that are used most often? What are the words that can best be described, used to describe this passage? What appears most often? What about, what do you think the main verse of this passage is? Psalm chapter 2. Verse 8. Verse 8. Actually, I agree with you wholeheartedly. What, you want to go ahead and read it for us? So we have someone who doesn't keep up with the classic. Go ahead. No, but I no, I should agree with you if it's my notes. But no, I go with verse 8. And you don't have to have just one verse to sum up the passage. Sometimes you can have two. It might be three. Because remember, when it comes to the verses, those little numbers were added at a later date after the Bible was already written. Some monk came along and divided the Bible into chapters and verses to make it easier for us. But verse 8 states this. Ask of me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost part of the earth for thy possession. Does anybody see any other verse or verses that might uh, conclude, uh, be key verses in this passage? If you don't, that's fine. If you do, that's fine as well. Because like I said, the whole point of a key verse is what is that verse of verses that we can use to summarize this whole chapter in a nutshell? described it in this manner. 
The yoke of Christ is intolerable to a graceless neck, but to the sinner, saved by his precious blood, it is easy and light. And he takes that from Matthew eleven twenty nine. If someone wants to go ahead and read that, Matthew eleven twenty nine. Acts 4.25, if you just want to keep your finger there, because 
we're going to be referencing back and having you reread that here in a second. But export what we have on. We have a direct quote from the book of Psalms in the New Testament. And who did they say the author was? David. So the early New Testament church stated that the author of Psalm chapter 2 was David. I'm going to get to that one in a second, brother. But yes, Acts 4, 25 and 26 both point to the fact that David wrote Psalm chapter 2. So the Bible interpreted itself and told us who wrote Psalm chapter 2. When we look at Psalm chapter 2 and just looking at the quick history of it, there really isn't a lot to go on, but there are some things we know without a shadow of a doubt. We can conclude after reading the six verses of Psalm chapter 1 that this is the very first psalm that is written and it's clearly referring to the Messiah. Now when we try to get the date of this psalm, it is unknown. But if we go a little bit farther, we know that this was an important psalm because this was a psalm, not that other psalms part, because as we go through the book of Psalms and we study, we're going to be looking to uh, the New Testament and seeing where they were quoted. But Psalm chapter 2 was quoted on three different occasions for sure. Well, more than three different occasions. But three, four verses out of the book of Psalm 2 were quoted in the New Testament. The very first one was Psalm chapter 2 and verse 1. You still got your mom, your finger in Acts there, mom? So give me one moment. I'm going to read this and then we'll listen to mom. Acts chapter 2 and verse 1. Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? If you read Acts 4.25, and we'll see that this verse is referenced also in verse 26. By the mouth of thy servant David has said, Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine vain things? So we have a direct quote and a reference to Psalm chapter 2 and verse 1 in Acts 4.25 and 26. Now, if someone would please find Acts 13, Acts 13.33, someone else, Hebrews 1.5, and if you're going to find Hebrews 1.5, you might as well find Hebrews 5.5 5 as well, please. Hebrews 5.5 5 and 1.5. Someone else, Acts 13.33. Okay, and Psalm chapter 2 verse 7 states, I will declare the decree the Lord has said unto me, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten. Does anyone have Acts 13 and 33? Chapter 2, 8 and 9, 
if someone would please find Revelation 12.5, Revelation 12.5, and someone else, Revelation 19.15, Revelation 19.15, and the, uh, someone else, Revelation 12.5, and I will read Psalm 2, 8 and 9. As for me, and I shall give thee the heathen for thine inheritance, and the uttermost parts of the earth for thine possession. Thou shalt break them with a rod of iron, thou shalt dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Does anybody have Revelation 12, 5? And she brought forth a man child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. So it was referenced in 12, 5, and what about Revelation 19, 15? So as we go through the book of Psalms, chapter 2, we find that four of the verses were quoted and or referenced in the New Testament. Now, we're going, with the last 10 minutes, we're going to talk about the phrase, the begotten Son of God. In Psalm chapter 2, in verse 7, the Bible states, I will declare the decree of the Lord, and the Lord has said unto me, Thou art my Son, this day have I begotten thee. If we think about the word begotten in the Bible, where do we normally associate it? Adam. Normally we associate it with those genealogy chapters that we all love so much. And so and so we get so and so. And so and so we get so and so. And so and so we get so and so. And so and so we got so and so. And we kind of gloss over it. So we think about the natural birth of man. So when we look at Psalm chapter 2, verse 7, is God referring to the natural immaculate birth of Jesus Christ? That is the question that is posed at hand. What does he mean by this day have I begotten thee? When did Christ become the begotten Son of God? If we would take the word of Spurgeon, he encourages us not to try to speculate or even understand the meaning of this phrase because it is too deep of a matter for mortal man to understand. And he likened it to the Trinity that we will never fully understand it. So why even bother? That's taken from the treasury of David. But when it comes to the Word of God, there's nothing wrong with questioning the Word of God. There's nothing wrong with praying and seeking an answer. God, what do you mean in this passage? There's nothing wrong with digging into the Word of God and trying to find an answer. Does it mean that we always get an answer? No. But it is the glory of God to conceal the matter, but it is the glory of kings to search it out. If we want to be honorable, if we want to really know what God is saying, we cannot be afraid to question the Word of God because every time God will prove that His Word is true, infallible, and there's nothing wrong with trying to dig in and fully understand it because to fully understand, not that in this life we'll fully understand the Word of God, but the more that we understand the Word of God, the more of a revelation of God we have, and the closer our relationship with Him should be. Because we've taken the time to study the Word of God honestly that we may know Him, and we've taken time if we've to study, if we've taken the time to study, then we should have also taken time to pray over and say, God, reveal this truth to me. So when did Jesus Christ become the begotten Son of God? If we were really to understand this, we already read the passages for today, but Acts chapter 13 and verse 33 sheds light upon this matter. Someone would go ahead and read it. Acts 13, 33. So if you look at this verse carefully, what is God talking about in the very beginning, in the first two phrases? What does he state? He's dealing with the resurrection of Jesus Christ. 
And then he goes on to add some more light to it, and he goes back to the book of Psalms. So in that he has raised Jesus up again, or raised up Jesus again, he didn't say start a new topic, but he said, as it is written. So he's referencing and adding more, more meaning to what he just said. He has raised up Jesus Christ from the dead, and then he points to the fact that it's already been prophesied way back in the book of Psalms. And what did he prophesy in Psalm chapter 2? What's the last phrase that's really two clauses in Acts 13, 33? Thou art my son, this day and I this, thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. On what day? On the day of the resurrection of Jesus Christ. That is the day that we are referring to in Psalm chapter 2. When we, if we would go a little bit farther and dig a little bit more to find out the meaning behind this phrase, we know that the phrase, the begotten son of God, has occurred in two other verses of the Bible. In Hebrews chapter 2 and Hebrews chapter 5. I'm going to go ahead and read these passages because I want to read six verses. Because if we're really going to understand something, if we're really going to come to a conclusion, we can't take a phrase here or a verse there, but we need to look at the verses in context with the verses before and the verses after, and possibly the chapters before or after as well. But if we look in Hebrews chapter 2, verses 1 through 6, the Bible states, Therefore we ought to give a more earnest heed to the things which we have heard, lest at any time we should let them slip. For if the word spoken by angels was steadfast, every and every transgression and disobedience received a just recompense of reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation, which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord, and was confirmed to us by them that heard him, God also bearing them witness, both with signs and wonders and with divers miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost according to his own will. For unto the angels hath he not put in subjection the world to come, whereof we speak. But one in a certain place testified, saying, What is man that thou art mindful of him, and the son of man that thou visitest him? Something special happened. At the resurrection. 
At the resurrection, he became, took over the office of a high priest because we know that he said to Mary Magdalene, do not touch me yet because I have not gone before the Father. The high priest would take the sin offering every year and take it in before the throne of God in the Holy of Holies. But in the office of high priest in verse 5, we find that for unto which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. So we know that Jesus Christ became the only begotten Son of God, well, the begotten Son of God at the resurrection, after the resurrection, at the resurrection. And finally, that is confirmed in Hebrews chapter 5 and 1 through 6. For every high priest, take notice, that's the office that Christ is in now, taken from among men is ordained from for men and things pertaining to God, that he may offer both gifts and sacrifices for sin, who can have compassion on the ignorant and on them that are out of the way, for that he himself also is compassed with infirmity. And by reason hereof, he ought as for the people also, so, so also for himself to offer for sin. And no man taketh his honor unto himself, but he that is called of God, so is Aaron. And verse 5. So also Christ glorified himself, glorified not himself to be made a high priest, but he that said unto him, Thou art my son, today have I begotten thee. And verse 6, as he saith also in another place, Thou art a high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So when did Christ become the begotten of God and according that we see in Psalm chapter 2? At the resurrection of Jesus, at his resurrection. And finally, I know we need to conclude, but if someone would please read Psalm chapter 1 and verse 4, and it is in your notes if you want to read it. It's the very last thing, unless you'd rather find it. Is that Romans 1 4? I'm sorry. Sorry, wrong book. I was in the right Bible. I was just in the wrong book. But Romans 1 4. And declared to be the Son of God with power according to the Spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. Now, it was declared by the power of the Holy Ghost and evident by his resurrection, but it states that he was declared to be the Son of God by the resurrection of the dead. What resurrection of the dead are they talking about? They are referring to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Why is he the begotten Son of God, the first begotten? Because he's the first one to ever be raised from the dead through the power of the Holy Ghost. Not that Lazarus wasn't, but for the first, let me back up. He's the first one to receive his glorified body through the power of the resurrection by coming back from the dead through the power of the Holy Ghost. He was the first fruits of the resurrection. And we will be part of the first fruits on that day if we are right with God when he calls his church home. Does anybody have any thoughts, any questions, anything they want to ask? If not, we'll bow our heads and prepare our hearts for service. Gracious Heavenly Father, we give you all praise and glory for everything you've done for us and will do. Lord, we give you all praise and glory because you alone are holy and worthy of God. Now, Lord, even right now, we rebuke every attack of the enemy that should come our way. We pray that you set your angels on the four corners of the property. Above and below, that no attack of the enemy may penetrate. I pray that our hearts and our minds will be in one mindset, one accord, that we may worship you in sincerity and truth, that the Holy Ghost may have his way and not be hindered in any manner. We pray, Lord, that you know the song leader, the musicians, Lord, give them a special blessing as they praise you upon the string instruments, the vocal cords, Lord. Anoint the pastor as he brings forth your word today. Anoint his mind and his, mind and his lips that your word will flow forth, Lord. And I pray that our hearts and our minds will be Father, they be good soil for your word to follow on, that we may remember it throughout the week, but even greater than that, that we would apply it to our lives, Lord, that we would be even farther transformed into your very image, Lord. 
less of us and more of you. We ask all these things in the name of Jesus.